So we've now defined the weight space decomposition for an SU3 representation. So if we have a representation of SU3 on a complex vector space V, then V splits as a direct sum of pieces WKL, where WKL is a simultaneous eigenspace for the set of matrices R of the diagonal matrix E to the I theta 1, E to the I theta 2, E to the minus I theta 1 plus theta 2. So that's a collection of matrices as theta 1, theta 2 vary. And we're looking for the vectors V, which are simultaneously eigenvectors for all of those, where the eigenvalue, well, it depends on theta 1, theta 2, it's going to be E to the I, K theta 1 plus L theta 2. Another way of thinking about this, remember, is if we pass to the Lie algebra level, um, then we get a Lie algebra representation of the same vector space V, and you know, R of this matrix, which is e to the something, it becomes e to the R star of another matrix. So we can also think of these as simultaneous eigenvectors of R star theta 1, theta 2, minus theta 1, minus theta 2, uh, where the eigenvalue is going to be k theta 1 plus L theta 2. And remember that this matrix here is not actually in little su2, is it little su3? It's in little sl3c um, because it's not uh, anti Hermitian. So we had to complexify the representation to define this. So the k and the l here are integers, and the way I was drawing the weight diagram was to, you know, plot k and l that appear in the decomposition as blobs um, at the sort of integer points of a, a lattice, but the lattice I was using was not the standard integer lattice where the axes are at 90 degrees to one another. Instead, I was using this one where the axes are at 120 degrees to each other um, to make the pictures more symmetrical. And I'm just going to uh, change notation slightly. I'm going to write um, the weight space now as W lambda, where lambda is a function of theta. So. Um, Lambda, let me say this is the set of V such that R star theta 1 theta 2 minus theta 1 minus theta 2 of V equals lambda of theta V. So I'm just encoding K and L as the coefficients of some linear function lambda of V. The reason for this is because you can, you can imagine if I increase N, so I'm looking at SU N, the number of integers that I need is going to be n, and I don't want to write n integers, I just want to write one symbol to stand for n integers, and that symbol is going to be lambda. So some particular lambdas, you know, lambda could be L1 of theta, which is defined to be just theta 1. It could be L2 of theta, which is theta 2. It could be L3 of theta, which is, well, Theta 3 would be the third entry here, which is minus theta 1 minus theta 2. Or it can be any combination of these three guys. But these three, I'll, I'll just plot where they occur in this diagram. L1 is at k equals 1, L equals 0. That's here. L2 is going to be here. And L3 is at k equals L equals minus 1. That's down here. So I'm just giving these points special names, L1, L2, L3. Okay, so for example, we did the adjoint representation last time, um, and I've plotted the weights of the adjoint representation as blobs in this picture, the, the black blobs in this picture. You can see there's a blob at this point, which is, well, you go along L1 and then you go backwards along L3. So this is L1 minus L3. Um, so which weight space is that? Um, well, if you remember, in the adjoint representation, if we use this matrix H theta, which is this matrix here, theta 1, theta 2, minus theta 1, minus theta 2, and we applied it to Eij, the matrix with a 1 in position Ij and zeros elsewhere, what we got was theta i minus theta j Eij. So 
EIJ is in the weight space with weight LI minus LJ in this, in this new notation, right? Because LI is theta I, LJ is theta J. So, um, so the L1 minus L3, this weight space is spanned by EIJ, sorry, E13. So WL1 minus L3 is just the one dimensional space spanned by the matrix e I, uh, E13. And then we have some other ones we have down here, L1 minus L2, so that's spanned by E12, etc. And we have six of those. And then we had these diagonal matrices uh, with weight zero. Okay, so this is just recapping what we did last time with a slightly different notation because the notation is going to be useful for what we do next. So what we're going to do next is try to figure out the analog for SU3 of the X and Y that proved so useful when we analyzed the representations of SU2. So for SU2, the weight diagram for the adjoint representation, which if you remember is called the root diagram, looked like this. In weight two, we had the weight space spanned by X. That was the matrix uh, 0, 1, 0, 0. In weight zero, we had the matrix H, which was this diagonal matrix. And in weight minus two, we had Y, which was 0, 0, 1, 0. And X and Y turned out to be really useful in the way they acted on the representation. Remember, X translated weights to the right and y translated weights to the left. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the weight vectors for the adjoint representation in a similar way here. In other words, we're going to investigate how EIJ acts in each representation. So here's the claim. Uh, I'll call it a lemma rather than a claim. Lemma. Um, if we have um, Lee group representation R from SU3 to GLV, complex vector space V, then R star complexified again to, of EIJ, because EIJ itself is not in the Lie algebra of SU3, it's in the complexification of it. This sends the weight space with weight lambda to the weight space with weight lambda plus L i minus L j. What does that look like? Let me just copy this picture, bring it down. So how does E13 act? In, in, for example, for the adjoint representation, it acts by translating weight spaces in the L1 minus L3 direction. So which direction is that? Well, if this is the origin here, uh, it's this direction here. Right, that's the point L1 minus L3. In other words, everything moves up and to the right. Whereas E31 acts by, you know, translating in the L3 minus L1 direction, which is the opposite direction. This weight down here is L3 minus L1. So this guy acts in the opposite direction. In other words, if you start with a vector in, in, in say this weight space and you act with E31, it's gonna move along these blue arrows. Um, and if it falls off the edge of the weight diagram, you get zero because there's zero weight spaces there. So similarly, I'm just going to do some more examples before I prove the lemma. Let's do E1 minus E2, sorry, E12. So how does E12 act? Um, well, it translates things in the L1 minus L2 direction, which we've seen 
is this direction. And you can see it's kind of moving things to to the um, to the right. You kind of you go across, you cross this edge, and then you get to this point here. Um, whereas over here, I'm going to draw what's the next one? Uh, let's say E two three. So where's E two three? Well, we go along L one. Oh, sorry, no, along L two, which is uh, up here, and then backwards along L three. L three is down here, so you end up going to this vector. So this is E23, this is how it acts. Translates things directly upwards. Okay, so my picture's a bit slanted just because I'm not very good at drawing lattices. These are supposed to go directly upwards if I draw it accurately. And what about E21, oops, E21? Well, that's gonna move things in the L2 minus L1 direction. That's exactly opposite to these red arrows. And similarly, E32 moves things in the E3 minus, sorry, L3 minus L2 direction, and that's vertically downwards. So this is the analog of how X and Y move things to the left and to the right. We have three different directions in which we can move things using sort of E13 in one direction and E3 in the opposite direction. Then we have E12 in a different direction, E21 to go backwards. And the third direction vertically is E23. And to go down, we use E32. So here's another example. This is the weight diagram of the standard representation. We had just three weights, L1, L2, L3, corresponding to the basis vectors E1, E2, E3. How do our uh, matrices act? Well, let's just let's just do one example. Let's do uh, E13, which is the matrix 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. And this is actually how this guy acts in the standard representation by definition of the standard representation. In other words, the standard representation is the thing that says if we have a matrix, just think of it as a matrix itself. That's how it acts. Uh, okay, so how is this supposed to act? Well, it sends E1 to the first column, which is nothing, E2 to the second column, which is nothing, and E3 is going to the third column, which is 1, 0, 0, that's E1. So we should be going from L3 to L1, right? Because L3 is the weight space spanned by E3, L1 is the weight space spanned by E1. So it really should just be acting like that, and that is exactly the direction um, the E13 was translating in up and to the right. And you can see that if you do L1, you start at L1 and you move along the E13 direction, you get to a zero weight space, so you have to get zero similarly with L2. So that works. And you can do the same with the other matrices E, I, J. Okay, so it's high time that I proved this lemma. So the lemma said that if I start with a vector in the weight space W lambda, I apply EIJ, and I have to write R star C EIJ for this to make sense, to V, and then I, I get to the weight space lambda plus uh, LI minus LJ. This is what we want to prove. So what does it mean to be in W lambda? This is if and only if um, V is an eigenvector of R star C H theta with eigenvalue lambda of theta. And over here we have a similar, similar story. This holds if and only if R star C E I J V is an eigenvector of r star c h theta with eigenvalue lambda plus l i minus l j of theta. 
which is lambda of theta plus theta i minus theta j, just by definition of what l, i, and l, j are. Okay, so, well, what do I know about multiplying h theta and e to the e i j? Well, I know that add h theta e i j equals theta i minus theta j e i j because e i j is in the weight space for the adjoint representation with weight l i minus l j. That's where this l i minus l j is, is really coming from. It comes from the, the weight of e i j. What is add h theta e i j? It's by definition it's h theta bracket e i j. That's what the adjoint representation is. So now if I apply my representation of Lie algebras to this equation, I get r star c of the bracket h theta with e i j equals, um, well, I can bring r star c inside the bracket because it's a representation of Lie algebras. So this is um, bracket r star c h theta with r star c e i j and on the right hand side you know I just get theta i minus theta j r star c e i j but this bracket I can write out it's a commutator bracket it's r star c h theta r star c e i j minus r star c e i j r star c h theta. Okay, so now I'm going to apply both sides of this equation to v. Uh, let's just copy and paste some of it. Save me writing a load of r's. Um, if I apply both sides to, to v, What do I get? I get r star c h theta r star c e i j v minus r star c i e i j r star c h theta v equals theta i minus theta j r star c e i j v. Okay, let's just rearrange by taking this guy onto the right hand side. Now, what was I trying to compute? Let's just go and have a look. I was trying to prove this formula here. So what I want is precisely r star c h theta r star c e i j v. And that's what I've got on the left hand side of my formula now. And what that is is r star c a i j r star c h theta v plus something. And v is an eigenvector of r star c h theta with eigenvalue lambda theta. So this first term here becomes just lambda theta times r star c e i j v. And the second term here is already a multiple of r star c e i j v. It's uh, theta i minus theta j times r star c e i j v. So altogether, I get exactly what I wanted, which was lambda of theta. There should be brackets around that theta there plus theta i minus theta j times r star c e i j applied to v. Okay, that's the end of the proof. So all I've used really here is first of all the fact that r star is a Lie algebra representation which allowed me to take it inside the brackets and more importantly I've used this I've used the fact that add h theta of e i j is theta i minus theta j of e i j. In other words, I use the fact that e i j is a root vector, a weight vector for the adjoint representation. And you can imagine if I do this argument more generally, the result will just be, you know, instead of instead of the lemma saying I start with a weight vector with weight lambda, I end up with weight lambda plus li minus lj. The claim will be if I act using a root vector where the weight is something, 
let's say uh, kappa, then the weight space with weight lambda will move to the weight space with weight lambda plus kappa. That's what's going on here. So the next thing we're going to do is use this to show that the weight diagram has a huge amount of symmetry, which is going to tell us that the weight diagram has to be a hexagon or a triangle.